Okay, we've loaded the room up. We are ready to go. All that remains is for me to introduce our keynote speaker, who is a man who's uh, known as being um, somebody who's appeared on the television a lot, uh, talking about a, a variety of things, including human evolution, uh, how the brain has evolved, how children uh, develop, uh, but who essentially describes himself as a medical uh, research scientist, famous, yes, for his work in IVF, but also with a background across uh, a, a great uh, number of different areas in medical science. And it's a great privilege to be able to introduce our keynote speaker today. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Winston. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to expand your minds or not, but I'll, I'll do my best. I have to try and expand my own, and I'll explain why in just a second. Um, I'm going to start um, with this painting, and I don't know, there's an awful lot of light on the stage, so it worries me that you can really see my slides. I wonder if you could, is it possible to have the lights down on the stage, please? So, because most of these uh, the slides will be washed out otherwise. We could have a, a little bit more dark. Thank you. Uh, many of you, of course, will know this remarkable painting. It's one of the most enigmatic paintings of the late Renaissance. It's one that probably has puzzled art historians almost than any other. It's, of course, uh, Velasquez's famous painting of uh, Margarita Isabella, who is, uh, 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 who is here, the, the Infanta. So Margarita here is probably about six. And she is uh, with her two attendants. Um, she's with uh, uh, Maria on one side, Isabel on the other side. And in the background, wearing mourning, is um, Donna Marcella. And this strange figure in the doorway is Nieto uh, Velasquez, no relation to the painter, uh, uh, Velasquez himself, Diego Velasquez. Um, and people have puzzled over this painting because the thing that is striking about it is that when you look at it, you realize that nobody's looking at anybody. There's no communication between the various people in the painting. And the question really is, what is Diego Velasquez actually doing here with this massive canvas? As far as we know, there's no canvas of this size that Velasquez painted anywhere in Europe. So that's also a puzzle. Moreover, the height of this chamber identifies it very clearly uh, in the palace in Madrid. So we know that this is where um, the king, uh, uh, Philip IV, uh, lived. And of course, here we have the mirror on the wall here. And here is presumably Philip uh, and his wife, that would be Mariana. Um, and extraordinarily, the question is, is that reflection of what we can see where we're standing or where we're sitting, or is it something reflecting what's on the canvas? Uh, certainly, it's very indistinct, which is untyp untypical of Velasquez. Now, what, of course, interests me in that painting is none of the things which have been dissected repeatedly by a whole range of art critics. And if you go to, for example, Barcelona, uh, you will see, uh, for example, what Picasso has done with that painting. He's cut it up into about 36 different miniature paintings to try to analyze the relationships of various figures. The striking thing is that the one person who has the absolute dignity there, uh, and who's really looking at us, is this woman, uh, Maria Bartola, with her little friend here, Nicholas Potosato. Um, I don't know the name of the dog, by the way. Um, what's, what's fascinating is that this dwarf, this achondroplastic dwarf, uh, possibly it's a genetic condition, uh, though it doesn't always uh, be genetic, um, is striking because unlike any other European painter of this period or earlier, he paints this dwarf as a human being. He actually values the dwarf. He paints the dwarf to, with the dignity. And if you look at any, I challenge you to go through any art gallery in Britain or in Italy or in Spain and find a painting of a dwarf or a deformed individual that is not downgraded as a sort of work of the devil, usually with an animal by, usually often a monkey, 
uh, often looking uh, threatening Jesus, for example, in many, in, in many pictures. So that is very interesting about Velasquez. So Velasquez is actually very perceptive about uh, communication. And I think what's interesting about this is it shows you very strikingly um, something about uh, the human brain and how it works. And when you think about it, in 1656, this is really now the height of where we're starting to explore the human mind in a way never before. And that's really what I want to talk about. That remarkable change in our culture occurred around about this time, a little bit earlier, but by this time it's in full flow. And it's very, very striking because I'm now going to show you, if I've got my slides in the right order, the tool which led to this painting. It's the most important tool that humans ever invented. Um, and it's... Um, here, in the British Museum. It's a stone hand axe, and it's one and a half million years ago. And the interesting thing about that stone hand axe is that without this, we would not be sitting in this room, I wouldn't have a computer, we wouldn't have our culture. Because with that hand axe, what pre-humans did was to, in fact, generate their own evolution. Because with this axe, we were able to deflesh the bones of dead animals, get meat which drives the brain and the lipids which make our brain much bigger. And of course, as we develop that hand axe over the next period of time, a long period of time, um, we started to be able to um, make hand axes which are slightly more sophisticated. Interestingly, what's striking about this hand axe is that this is also in the British Museum in London, and it's over a million years later. And what is obvious to all of us in this room that it hasn't changed either in size, shape, or chipping. And the interesting thing about that is that in a million years, nobody had the idea of attaching it to a stick. Nobody thought of making it into a spear or an axe, using it as a weapon with that leverage. So it is really rather extraordinary to think that now we're in a society where we're thinking about a whole range of different things. And the question really is, how does that come about? And so here we have, I think, a very good example of how long it took to build the human mind. And, of course, I keep on thinking that I've got a clicker. And, of course, I've got this clicker in my pocket, which is really rather silly of me. There we are. So here we are in the Rift Valley in Kenya. And, uh, ah, that's what I want. So this is where mankind started. And... Wherever you look, through 360 degrees, there's not the slightest sign now of any habitation. Um, you can go right the way around, and there's no, uh, there's no houses, uh, no roads, uh, no aerial masts. There's absolutely nothing, no technology there. And that's really rather surprising, because, of course, I was just posing for this photograph with the skull of um, Australopithecus afarensis in my, in my left hand, and Homo erectus in my right hand, explaining evolution to a camera, when uh, there was a buzzing from my pocket, uh, um, which shouldn't really have happened. Uh, you can see the buzz, you can see the bulk thing, and it was my mobile phone, <laughs> which doesn't work in London, but worked perfectly in, 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 in Kenya. And, and the thing was, it was Richard Dawkins on the telephone saying, would, would, I, would, I, write a, would I sign a letter to the Times um, being extraordinarily angry as he was about the fact that um, evolution was not being taught in schools but creation was in a particular school. And I said, well, should I won't sign a letter like that because I actually don't think there's anything wrong in trying to give a wider view and people making up their own mind anyway. But in any case, I don't think scientists holding um, kind of uh, really ag ag aggravated conversations in the media is really going to change people's minds anyway. The point about the photograph, though, is that the brain size of this creature, uh, Australopithecus afarensis, this is Lucy, of course. The reason why she's called Lucy, anybody know? Because, of course, when the paleontologists dug her out of the ground in the Olduvai Gorge, um, they were playing the radio. It's very boring, you know, digging bones out with a brush, slowly, bit by bit. And Lucy in the sky with diamonds, the Beatles was on the radio. So that's what, so she was called Lucy. So this is Lucy. Her brain capacity is 450 milliliters. A million years later, Homo erectus is doubled. Now, in evolutionary times, that's striking. Animals don't develop that rapidly in evolution in general. So this is now 900 milliliters. 
and modesty forbids me to mention there's a third cranium on the photograph, but actually <laughs> <coughs> um, the, the modern human brain is about 1,470 milliliters, 1,430 milliliters, depending how you measure it. Uh, I've never measured it, but other people have done, and there are about 130 papers in scientific journals measuring the human brain. God knows why we're so preoccupied with that size. Because actually it turns out that uh, you men in the audience have a brain which is 70 milliliters larger than you women in the audience. And if you want to know why that is, you can stop looking so pleased with yourselves, males. <laughs> because actually the reason for that, of course, is that we males are not prepared to ask directions to where we're going. <laughs> There's actually no difference in, in intelligence. Um, there are different attributes, and I'm not going to deal with gender issues in learning because it's really a complicated subject on its own, and it's certainly worth a, an, another keynote speech. I'm not offering, but I'm just saying that it's really, a quite, it's really quite an interesting issue in its own. Now, the striking thing, of course, is that this brain has been around, the Homo sapiens brain, for 100,000 years. So I've drawn a line across this, this, uh, this photograph representing 100,000 years, and there's a tiny blue dot up there which represents the time since Velasquez painted that painting just in scale. So what has happened, of course, is that the genes which make this brain existed in Homo sapiens 100 years ago, but it's not the genes which make us now, because now there's something else going on, and that in itself is, I think, uh, interesting. So in 1599, Shakespeare writes Hamlet, one of the most important examples early on of understanding our humanity. By uh, 1609, in the University of Padua in Italy, of course, we have um, that amazing man, Galileo, looking at the moons of Jupiter and showing that we are not in a geocentric universe, um, but we are actually uh, all going around other bodies. So, in fact, we're not the center of what we know. And that was a very important thing in 1609. And it was um, following, really, Copernicus's ideas much earlier, about 80 years earlier. By um, 1800, we have the remarkable invention, which, of course, leads to what we all use today, the motor car. Trefithic built the first powered motor, which was, in fact, a steam engine that went up a hill in Camborne in Cornwall, about 1801. And that really changes us completely because the Industrial Revolution, of course, is part of that. And then just about 26 years later, in 1826, we have this phenomenon. No sound. Oh, just let me turn the sound down a bit, little bit. Can we have the sound up a little bit? Maybe I could do it. Well, we could sit here and listen it to the whole morning, because this is, this is, um... This is Beethoven's string quartet that he wrote about a year before he died. By this time, he's completely deaf. And this counterpoint is something which is so advanced in thinking that it would have been completely puzzling to an audience in Bonn or Vienna just 25 years earlier. Now, of course, we understand what he's doing with this opening movement of this remarkable quartet. But, of course, it changes the mold of Western music, just as Velasquez is going to change the mold of painting in the West. And that is iconic, because now we can see very clearly that what's actually happening is that the human mind is developing so rapidly that now, of course, just a few hundred years later, We've got portable computing. We've landed on the moon, and we can make synthetic organisms in the laboratory. We can actually make living organisms which actually can reproduce in the lab. That's been done in the last two years. And in fact, at Imperial College, where I work, we use synthetic biology extensively for all sorts of very good reasons. It's not just to make monsters, but it's in fact to try and see how we can absorb carbon dioxide, to see how we can actually make new drugs, and so on. So, the extraordinary point is this, that we are in a situation where our mind is now so developed that we are learning rapidly and exploring that mind in a way as never before. So much so that when Hamlet was written in 1599, you could argue that 
Shakespeare might have leant over the parapet of London Bridge and spat in the water and said, well, this view's not gonna change in the next hundreds of years. We can't say that any longer. We don't know um, really where we will be in five years' time technologically. We don't know where we will be with learning, in fact, in five years' time, because there are massive research going on in the field. So what I'm gonna do now is to try to show you how learning actually happens. What is going on in the brain? So I'm going to use something which is very important in learning terms, which is a metaphor. One of the ways that we learn is by metaphor. We, turn, we learn partly by story. So I'm going to show you a visual metaphor, um, and I'm going to demonstrate the synapse. Basically, each of you in this room has around 100 billion neurons. It's an amazing number. And each of those neurons is connected over 2,000 times to other neurons. So each of you have got the most complicated object known in the universe. And it's extraordinary to consider what that actually means in terms of how much we don't use. But it's more complicated than the telephone exchange of New York, London, Rome, Paris, all put together, each of you. That's, a, that's an amazing thought, a number of con connections. So let's look at those connections, because the connections are so small, you need a very powerful microscope to see them. Learning something new means rearranging the way her brain works. Our brain has an astonishing hundred billion neurons, or brain cells, all connected together. Learning is about creating and strengthening pathways through these neurons for impulses of electricity. But between each and every connection in our brains, there's a tiny gap called a synapse. For any of us to learn something new, the electrical signal has to jump across this gap to continue its journey. The gap between the two brain cells is tiny, but that doesn't mean that it's straightforward for a signal to get from one side to the other. For us, it's like crossing a deep ravine. I'm going to try to get from one side to the other, and how I do it should tell me something about the way we learn. The first time a signal crosses from one brain cell to the other demands the most effort. And it's the same when we cross our ravine. The first trip across is the hardest. Having crossed the ravine once, the journeys across get easier and easier. And a similar thing happens when we learn something. To start with, learning is difficult. the signal crosses the gap between the brain cells again and again, we establish a more solid pathway. Sorry about that. By the time we've made the crossing over and over again, it becomes effortless. We can do it whenever we like.
So that is one aspect of learning. I've noticed, of course, I'm using the metaphor deliberately because it's a way of reinforcing what we're learning. One's much more likely to remember the synapse if one thinks about other examples of where we build up again and again something by repetition until we get it better and better. So that's part of the learning process. Another striking thing, of course, is this communication. Of course, the hand axe is very important in that because, of course, we're defenseless on the savannah. We don't have the claws and teeth that all the predators have. So we have to hunt in groups. So evolution also requires us to learn to communicate, something which women are much better at than we are. That brain is very different in women for that reason. This is striking because here is, uh, Will, uh, this is Owen, um, the, the famous uh, centre forward, Liverpool, uh, who's just missed the goal, just missed the goal, and in a fraction of a second, every single body in that photograph is doing the identical action. They've communicated with each other in this extraordinary way. So that communication occurs within about 0.25 of a second. It turns out that when you see somebody for the first time, your, your assessment of that face is made in about 0.3 of a second, and you decide whether that person is trustworthy or not trustworthy. That's a very important issue. Now, of course, you may be wrong, but there are certain signs which might make that person seem trustworthy. I'm not going to tell you what they are. you have to work that out for yourselves, because that's not part of the talk. But if you think about it, that's one of the reasons why actually we need to greet people pretty in a civilized fashion. I think it's a very important issue of our learning process. Now, one of the key issues, of course, is this. I'm not going to go into great lengths about the science, but of course, experience is critical. And the human brain matures fastest when we're young, when it's most plastic. So for example, an experiment done just over 50 years ago in Oxford, where they took a newborn cat, a kitten, and they blindfolded it for a matter of six weeks. When the blindfold is taken off, the eye is completely normal, the retina is completely normal, the lens is completely normal, the brain is completely normal, but that kitten is permanently blind because it hasn't had the experience of light to make the synapses at the back of the brain. It can't make the connections because that hard wiring is essential, a key part of human development. So you can see why we don't, in fact, in our society, I think, value early learning nearly enough, because those experiences are really critical to all of us, both as adults and also, of course, by improving the next generation, which, of course, becomes a key issue as well. Uh, we think as learning great geniuses, I've just put up four who are all regarded as geniuses. One is, um, well, that will be Marie Curie, uh, that'll be Isaac Newton, that I think probably needs an explanation, that's Isaac Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein, and that's Francis Crick. Everybody thinks that they have great brains. Actually, one of the things you know about Nobel Prize winners is that they may be very clever at their subject, but they know nothing about outside it very often and they are always hugely respected. It's fascinating, if you read the Times today, there's a letter from some Nobel Prize winners about the three-parent uh, child, which is you know, the thing that's in the news at the moment, and all promoting it, which of course is probably right. But their experience is not based in any way in reproduction. But of course, because they're Nobel Prize winners, they carry weight with the public, with the newspapers, and with the editor. That's not what I want. I'm not trying to decry their great work, because, in fact, uh, Paul Nurse, who's one of the signatories of the letter, I believe is one of our greatest living scientists. But the point I'm making, really, is that each of those has got a finite brain. And any two of you together have got more brain power than any of the people on that photograph. So what scientists need to do, of course, what we all need to do in any form of learning is to collaborate. That's why I've put learning and communication together, because learning and communication are inexplicably linked. And in my view, when we publish now as a scientist, I never publish, virtually never, a single author publication because I need the group around me who know much better and can work out different aspects of what we're trying to explore. So, we can't explain everything. This remarkable photograph of Kiri and Brielle is one that still, I think, is puzzling. It was published in a learned journal two or three years ago, and it shows this baby, Brielle, who was dying she was not thriving, she wasn't feeding, and this is her twin sister, Kiri, who was doing really well in an incubator. And because she was dying, they started to decide, they were deciding about taking the drips off and just leaving her, because it was obvious she was not thriving. But one 
nurse against all the rules of the premature baby unit, put the two twins together in the same incubator and took this photograph just an hour or two later. The arm of that's because it's fanciful stuff. You know, doesn't mean anything at all. What is remarkable and is monitored and has been published and has been validated is that immediately after that photograph, this kid stopped needing the drip, started to feed, and actually became a completely normal, healthy infant, now about age four or five. So we can't explain that communication. But again, you can see, presumably, there must be some communication involved that makes that possible, even in a premature infant of this kind. I want to show you a slightly older infant, and this is a bit self-indulgent, um, um, because you might understand uh, that this is a, a grandchild. Um, and um, this, this grandchild is going to meet with disaster in just a second, and, uh, and it's going to recover from the disaster. Remarkably, rather good parenting, I think. The mother uh, just carries on filming with her iPhone. She doesn't stop. <laughs> um, I showed this once before, or I've shown it a couple of times at meetings, and uh, the first time I showed it, I heard a whisper in the audience, my God, how can he show his daughter's kitchen in that state? <laughs> but watch this. you get the point. <laughs> but what's, of course, extraordinary is two things about the human brain there and this plasticity. One is the plasticity that leads to this stream of consciousness, which, of course, is really wonderfully inventive in us, which we tend to suppress, unfortunately, so often, but actually leads to some of that creation and imagination. But also, of course, you can imagine what particular technological article that the parents have that they use all the time. Because, of course, she doesn't speak, she doesn't have any language, but you can hear very clearly, hello, I think, when she answers the telephone, which is just sort of extraordinary how we imitate. So we learn by watching other people, and we do that throughout life. Of course, it's very important to children, and it leads to a very important aspect to, to the quality of what they are imitating. But we imitate and we learn from others in that way, which I think means that none of us is totally autonomous. And we have to, I think, think about that in our description. Another aspect of the brain is shown in this brief picture of this dog, whose name I can't remember either. But learning isn't just about facts and figures. Our mind also learns to do things. Think about driving a car or starting to walk as a child. Sometimes we're not even aware of learning. But that doesn't mean to say that it isn't complicated. Think about what even a dog's brain masters when it learns how to catch a ball. Oi! To this simple task, Rover's brain has to make a bewildering number of calculations. He has to work out the ball's speed, his own speed, plan the trajectory of his jump, all in a few milliseconds. In fact, if Rover had to work out how to catch the tennis ball, he'd need to use a powerful computer. This is Rover 1. Incoming target velocity 8.9. Rover 1 is now airborne. Impact in 3, 2, 1. Impact. I repeat, we have impact. Houston, the Beagle has landed. For Rover, this complex action has become instinctive. He's done it since he was a puppy. 
I don't know whether the dog really was called Rover. That's the problem I can't remember now. I made that film some time ago. But nonetheless, if you think about it, even quite simple movement becomes really exquisite. One of the unique movements that we have that no other animal has, of course, is this, the apposition of the finger and thumb. And that, of course, has been part of that development of the human brain, that ability to make very fine, <coughs> fine movements, fine manipulations, has led to something which never happened with apes because they, were <coughs> they walked on their knuckles. We walk, as those babies do, of course. You saw it with a little soft in that earlier photograph. She picks herself up on her palms. So we've changed quite considerably in evolution. <coughs> I'm going to be a bit self-indulgent now and show you another film clip because I think it shows you another example of learning which we often forget. And this remarkable young lady <coughs> was one of our potentials for the Olympics, for the Olympic Games. And um, I think the film speaks for itself. <coughs> Rebecca Owen took up gymnastics when she was just seven years old. Her life's ambition is to win an Olympic medal. She's practiced five and a half hours a day, six days a week for 10 years. Her hard work and great talent have already won her a silver medal in the 2002 Commonwealth Games. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, the crowd are marvellous. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and watching. And they just help you get your most faces for the whole competition. It's great. But to stand a chance of ever being selected for the Olympic team, Rebecca must learn a new, extremely difficult move. It's called a Ginga Salto. It involves flying off the high bar, performing a back somersault and a half twist before re-catching the bar. Basically, you'll watch somebody do it first so you can get a general idea of what you're going to be doing and what you want it to look like. And then you'll start the progressions and you'll get like feedback from your coach. And they'll tell you what to do, what not to do, where you're going right and wrong. Rebecca's coach is Colin Still. It's the turn, release the bar, arms down. What he begins by introducing her mind to the move. Did you see the bar all the way through? Yeah. Hold the shape. When we teach a move to people like Rebecca, any gymnast, they must concentrate at the beginning. They know nothing and we have to fill their mind with the idea of what we're trying to get across. And then we've got to get their body to follow their mind. It's time for Rebecca to try the Ginga Salto for real. So this one will take my hands now. The first time you do it on your own, you have to really concentrate on what you're doing. When you're stood there waiting to go, you do get a bit more nervous and you start to think about things that could go wrong. It's just not working. It's time for a more radical approach. It's a learning method called visualization. Rebecca won't have to move a muscle. Rather, she'll rehearse the entire sequence in her brain. Rebecca stands still and concentrates. She visualizes every stage of the somersault, the moment she releases the bar, the instant she twists her body, and the second she catches the bar. 
and she does this over and over again. Visualisation does help you when you're learning a new move. You can go through it in your brain before you actually have to do it yourself. Scientists have discovered there's a region of the brain that's activated when we imagine a body movement. Rebecca rehearses the move in her mind. She's creating pathways through her brain cells as if she were actually doing the somersault, all without moving a muscle. It means that when she does perform it for real, she should find it easier because the pathways in her brain are already in place. Will it work? Rebecca has repeatedly visualized each tiny twist and turn of the somersault in her mind. But has she established strong enough pathways to make her body do it for real? Right, that's a positive. so I can think about it less and think like, more about what happened on the last one and try and correct it again on the next one. When you start to do it in the competition, you do get a bit more nerves. You just have to tell yourself that you've done it millions of times and you know how to do it. Visualization helped Rebecca establish new pathways in her mind that enabled her body to complete the somersault. It's something which I think is really a trip of a whole range of learning issues. One of the issues, of course, also is memory. And memory is something which I've become recently increasingly interested in anyway. Uh, this photograph shows me above Wimbledon Common, about 2,000 feet in the air, uh, being filmed for a BBC program. And here's my pilot who's just uh, switching on the, the gas to get a bit more altitude. Um, and it looks great, a wonderful view down below. The only problem is that actually uh, we never left the ground. We didn't have a balloon. It's all photographed on the ground entirely. And um, why that's interesting to me is because we showed the parents of six and seven-year-old children photographs that we'd fo fo photoshopped very crudely of them when they si were six or seven. We got them from the grandparents, the photographs. And we photoshopped them into a hot air balloon. And then we showed them these photographs, quite a lot of parents, and asked them whether they remembered that experience of being in the hot air balloon all those years ago when they were kids like their kids are now. And they all denied any memory of the hot air balloon. By the following morning, half of them have phoned up to saying, I do remember. And I remember being frightened, or I remember the picture of the fields below me. I remember seeing, um, and I remember realizing we were descending, and I was worried as we were coming down, would it be dangerous? And I remember the bump of the basket. Completely created memory. Now, if you think about it, that's really important. One of the things that courts, for example, don't take into account is creative memory. If you think about, for example, all the you know, rather unpleasant and scurrilous things that have been going on with some of the issues over sexual crimes done some time ago, it's very difficult to know whether you can really trust the evidence of some of the people who, in good faith, are giving that evidence. Because under a stressful situation, it's possible they may have created much more out of what was quite a simple piece of contact. I think I'm not suggesting anything about the process. I'm merely saying that our 
belief in somebody's memory may be quite flawed, as is the actual memory itself. And I think that's a very difficult thing for courts to judge. It's very interesting. So that is, I think, something uh, to be thinking about in practical terms with learning as well. We create memories. Um, now, um, it's one thing to fill your brain with facts. Look at this it's memory. It's quite another thing, though, to remember them. So how do we do it? Well, memorizing something is rather like what happens when we set up a line of dominoes. When we commit a fact to memory, we create a neural pathway to it, a route of connecting brain cells to wherever that memory is stored in our brain. And to retrieve those facts, all we have to do is to trigger the same pathway back to them. First card was the six of spades. Same deck, the card was the 23. Uh, the 23rd card was the queen of hearts. Deck two, card number 27. Ten of diamonds. No matter how many cards we fired at him, that was the king of diamonds. And he remembered them perfectly. The 48th card was the Ace of Hearts. In fact, Andy is able to recall all 520 cards. Jack of Clubs. Every one correct and in the right order. Queen of Spades. So, what's his secret? What's his secret? <laughs> well, his secret is back to the savannah. And you know I mentioned that we males don't, don't ask questions to where we're going. What Andy Bell does, each card is represented in his mind by a place, the monument, the statue of, um, of Nelson, the Houses of Parliament, Charing Cross Station. And so basically he actually does a journey in his mind, building up those, he builds up a journey in his mind and he revisits those places in order. So our spatial memory, of course, is deeply hardwired in our brain. And that's one way of learning, of course, which some people have developed. It requires practice, of course, but it is possible to build up that spatial memory and use that spatial awareness in the way he does. Interestingly, I mean, I, I hope there are no relatives of Anthony Well in the audience, but he's probably not somebody who you'd want to perhaps share a submarine with. Um, it's not as if he's brilliantly intelligent, I mean, he's not, you know, he's got an, ordinary, got an ordinary brain, but he's built up that memory, in this case, by using what is essentially evolutionarily hardwired, the ability for us to find our way, even as a male, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to miss this slide. I'm going to go on because I'm, I'm worried about time. Um, and I think I might just mention Mahler's 10th um, uh, symphony, which was unfinished. Um, in fact, we can hear a bit of it now. 
One of the issues about creativity and how we use our mind depends very much on mood. And Gustav Mahler, as many of you will remember, was married to a woman called Alma Schindler, who was about 20 years younger than he was, she was, uh, very flirtatious. In fact, she had a large number of affairs. In particular, he'd recently opened a letter from the architect Gropius and recognized that they were having an affair. And Alma, um, in fact, um, was always suppressed by her husband because Mahler wanted to be the dominant figure in his household as he was as a conductor. And in fact, Alma was not a bad musician herself, but she never, in fact, found her creativity. So Alma and uh, Gustav had a strange relationship. This is about a few months before he died. Um, and you can hear s some of the music. And the music expresses the absolute pain that he has, which you can see, of course, he's written across the score, uh, goodbye, goodbye. Um, this, you know, there's really, in fact, there's no, there's no place for him any, any longer. And it's, it's pretty savage stuff. Um, and it's quite different from his earlier, much more uh, tonal compositions. For example, in the second symphony, the funeral march in the slow movement. But for reasons of time, I'm not going to play it now. But you get the idea that sometimes that creativity can be greatly helped by really what seems to be the wrong mood at the time. To show this, we took two men, Mr. Nice and Mr. Nasty, and placed them in a controlled environment. Then we asked several volunteers to meet them and discuss different subjects. Favourite films? Yeah, well, I've got plenty of those. Yeah, you go first. Um, what the volunteers didn't know was that while Mr. Nice was being friendly and warm, <laughs> Mr. Nasty was being as negative and as difficult as possible. So this is learning from other people's body movement. But crucially, both Mr. Nice and Mr. Nasty have been asked to deliberately move their bodies in specific ways. While cameras watched for a response from the volunteers that would reveal what was going on in their mind. Gradually, as the conversations developed, an extraordinary thing began to happen. I didn't. The volunteers with Mr. Nice gradually began to copy him. He kind of used very well, and the acting was very good. He kind of won over it, and no one's laughing at anything. I mean, I shouldn't have been no one could see something should like that. But there's something. Meanwhile, those with Mr. Nasty didn't copy him at all. But I'm really enjoying 24 at the moment. Have you seen it? So at once. Yeah, I just like it very much. No. I think it's the sort of thing I like going to the cinema with myself. Because the volunteers like Mr. Nice, their mind prompted them to mimic him. A subconscious attempt to strengthen the bond between them. So that, um, uh, that is really a, an extraordinary aspect to, um, to, to, to how we perceive each other and how we want to be part of that communication. Um, let me just finish with the notion of genetics and then I'm going to stop talking to give you a chance to ask, ask one or two questions. One of the questions is, what about learning skills? It turns out that um, it's not quite as difficult as it might well be. What uh, these experimenters did, Kleber, was to put a number of people in an MRI scanner, and they took, in this occasion, on this occasion, opera singers. So basically, what uh, this singer is singing, this very famous aria, Caro uh, Mio Bien, uh, which is, as you see, sc I've scored it in, uh, put the score down in C. Actually, in fact, the singer is singing, I think, in 
E flat, I'm not sure. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So any of you that are very musical will recognize that discrepancy, but it shouldn't actually matter here. So it's broken up into phrases. So the silence, they then inhale, they're asked to inhale, and then they sing a phrase like this, and then the silence again, and then they inhale. The silence is needed because, of course, as the brain is activated, it takes some time for the blood flow to get to that part of the brain that's been activated and for it to be measured on the ma magnetic resonance imaging scan. Eventually, of course, what you can see is that opera singers like this build up a brain which is quite extraordinary because, of course, opera singers actually use simultaneously almost more muscles than anybody else. It's, it is from the diaphragm out, all of those muscles in the face, for example, uh, to in fact make this kind of tone. And so what you can see is that opera singers have the most um, advanced, here you see the blood flow, and they have a really advanced motor cortex and larger auditory cortex. Some parts of the uh, other cortex is, uh, is also increased uh, very strikingly in Kleber's paper. What is interesting, though, is that this musical ability does not seem to be genetic because you can take other musicians who've never sung in their lives and teach them that aria and put them in a scanner as Kleber did and you can get identically after about three months the same expansion of those areas of the brain that we see on that scan. And so what Kleber did lastly was to take ordinary students who didn't play an instrument, who were not musicians at all, and put them in the scanner. And again, after enough months of practice, so we can all actually get to grade eight on the piano if we're prepared to practice enough times. That is really rather extraordinary. Now, of course, we won't necessarily be great musicians because that barrier between what is absolutely achieved by practice won't necessarily make us into geniuses. We won't become um, a, a Eugenie Kissin, for example, on the piano, but we can become highly competent at playing very difficult pieces. But of course, it requires, again, as I repeat and repeat, repetition. That's really of a key issue. So the question is, is, is musical ability ever genetic? Well, very interestingly, there's one very rare syndrome, William Buren syndrome, where these kids um, have about 26 genes missing uh, on the largest chromosome, chromosome one, and they show all sorts of defects. But one, one thing that's interesting about these children is that they have perfect pitch, and they are musical, and they can sing, even though their communication isn't very good, uh, and indeed they're very sociable, um, they're limited in language, but they do communicate exceptionally, and music is very important to them, which argues that there must be some genetic component to music, and probably musical intelligence, and therefore probably intelligence as well. I'm going to conclude with this photograph. This is um, Adrian Owen's work, which shows brain-damaged individuals who've been in an extensive car crash, and you can see how badly the skull has been dented here. And all these people have been deeply unconscious, these two, these are normal controls. So these people have had massive injuries to their head, resulting in loss of brain tissue. Now, they've been comatose for a year and a half in some cases, vegetables. They can't eat, they can't, they can't talk, they can't communicate. Uh, they have no obvious evidence of even living, except that they're just sitting there with their heart beating and they're perhaps on a respirator, in some cases they're able to breathe. What Adrian Owen has shown is that if you, in fact, talk to these people and say, if you can hear what I'm saying, or if the answer to this question is yes, imagine playing tennis, because tennis uses a whole lot of muscles. And here you can see, when he does that, the motor cortex lights up in the patient just as it does in a healthy volunteer. And with spatial navigation, imagine being in the kitchen, that lights up as well in exactly the same way. It's a very interesting aspect to uh, issue about how the brain works even when we seem not to have a brain at all. Very important to understand that. One of the last things that our elderly relatives will lose as they're dying is their hearing. Comatose people are still, at one level, deeply unconscious, but also conscious too. And so there is a very interesting aspect about how this kind of work to be expanded to understand better how we learn 
and how we, in fact, use our brain, most of which, of course, all of us here don't use nearly enough. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. I don't know whether it's the high-quality BBC film. I don't know whether it's the facts. I don't know whether it's that soft, persuasive delivery. I could keep listening to that forever, couldn't you? I could certainly listen to that for the rest of the day. Robert, thank you so much for that. We have got time for some questions. Uh, I'm, of course, I have lots of questions to ask. I always do. But does it, yes, we've got one here in the audience. Quickly throw it out, and let's get moving. So, for example, the use of smartphones and tablets yeah. are, are yeah. different gestures, the, the different way that we're learning. Yeah. How is that going to affect our neural connectivity well, in I, the next I, 20 years or of so? Of course, one of the things that you could never do uh, is to trust a scientist to predict the future any more wisely <laughs> than anybody else. So I think we'll have to have that caveat. But actually, my own view is that uh, electronic learning of that kind is immensely valuable, immensely useful. It's just that we haven't learned, how, we haven't learned yet how to use it wisely. <laughs> and I guess that one of the issues is how we use it in children under the right sort of supervision. And I think that's, so I, so I disagree very strikingly with, for example, Susan Greenfield, who thinks it's just bad. I don't think that's true. I think, in fact, there's an immense value in electronic communication. And I think we should grasp it, but learn how to use it like any technology. Any technology will have a downside. You know, every technology we use has a downside, but most technology, of course, will have the upside, otherwise you wouldn't have it in the first place. And so the tablet, you know, has been revolutionary. The smartphone is brilliant. That's great. Uh, any other questions? Yes, very quickly. Thank you. That was a fascinating subject. Um, you talked about the synapses being built when you're learning something. To what degree do that, does that decay and... Um, how can you keep pathways open if it does decay? Well, you, the, the synapses, of course... Uh, I mean, what's, of course, interesting is that each of you in this room, me as well, and Dom too, um, when we leave this room, the physical nature of our brain, the anatomy of our brain will have changed. It's extraordinary, because we've learned something. That is bizarre. But, of course, we won't, we won't retain that indefinitely. Those synapses, if they're not used, will presumably then be reallocated somewhere else. So... Of course, you know, neurons have around, as I say, about 2,000 connections, so there are about a large number of synapses. Some neurons have 100,000 connections. So, for example, one of the biggest important areas of the brain is actually here in the cerebellum, and some of those nerve cells, which are very important in learning, will have 200,000 connections. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I think what you're asking me is whether those connections are permanent or not. Well, they, they, well your brain will change when you leave this room, but by tomorrow morning, being, you know, average, you'll have forgotten everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. I doubt that. We, we, have, we have a question up here. <laughs> so let's, can we just use the mic, do you mind? Because then people at the back can hear you. Just for starters, um, this talk alone has been worth the whole visit to me. Thank you so much. But... <laughs> <laughs> But my question, early in your talk, you were saying about the rapid rate, of ac the accelerating rate of uh, the development of our mind. Do you think there's a limit? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I, there must be a limit, of course, um, uh, in our species, but, of course, we would evolve. What I think is fascinating is 100,000 years we've been on Earth. You think about it, the generation time for the Homo sapiens is 20 years. That's the... So, in fact, there's only been 5,000 generations of humans. That is amazing, isn't it? I find that absolutely mind-blowing. You know, we can go back to our great-great-great-grandparents. Yeah. It's only 5,000. Yeah. It's absolutely extraordinary. Now, so it would be really foolish to say that we couldn't change. Of course, the question is we may not survive for a long enough period for all sorts of reasons, some of which would may be due to our own problems that we create in, in the planet. Um, but... I'm, I'm sure the mind must develop. Whether we can start developing, for example, other senses, for example, or other, other ways of thinking, I think really is extraordinary. Of course, there comes a point 
if you change the genes enough, you're no longer the species that you started with because we are essentially defined by our genotype. The genome is really what makes us, by definition, what we are, although I don't think the accent on the genome is nearly as important as we say. I mean, one of the things I would have probably should have said in this talk is that I really decry the idea of genetics being used for learning. I mean, the fact is that people who are not wildly intelligent are not greatly different from people who are very intelligent. And really, I think the message should be, if I'm going to conclude, is that the most important thing that we might have learned from this lecture is that the environment that we create is the most important issue. It's the environment, actually. So we can't change our genetics, which is the answer to your question. But as sure as hell, we can change our environment. We can value teachers. We can actually give children a much better start. And I think that really is an important message for all of us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I don't know. Like, like, it's very difficult sometimes when you reach the end of a talk and you don't want to stop. I really would, we could carry on this conversation for a long time. And I've got burning questions to ask about the role of culture uh, during our evolution and, and our mind and so on. But I also have sadly a role as a conference chairman to keep us rigorously to our timetable. Uh, you've not just uh, shown us, you've altered our brains. I'm sure we won't forget tomorrow what you've said today. And we won't forget how you've made us feel as well. Rob Winston, thank you very much. Thank you.